And this is Off the Ball Saturday on News Talk. John Duggan with you through until five. Westmeath four points, Cavan three points in the Tottenham Cup final at Croke Park. We'll keep you up to date on that between now and the end of the show. But at the moment, we're going to talk tennis. This is the Saturday panel. We're concentrating on tennis between now and about 4.20 at the moment. In the Wimbledon Ladies Singles Final, it is one set all between Anze Jabir of Tunisia and Kazakhstan's Elena Rybakina. So Jabir took the first set 6-3, but um, Rybakina has just won the second set by six games to two. Down to a decider at centre court in Wimbledon. Just thrilled to be joined in studio here by two of Ireland's top former pros, Conor Nyland and Jenny Claffey. How's the form, folks? All good, John. How are you? Great. Yeah, all good. Thanks for having us. Great to be here. This is the time of year when everybody loves Wimbledon. Everybody gets out the tennis racket. Uh, everybody's, on, everybody's on the street. <laughs> we get asked on the radio. Yeah, yeah. it's a busy yeah. two yeah. weeks busy for two us. Weeks, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Go back into hiding now. It's on the Monday. shop window. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> what have we made of this? Because uh, Kazakhstan versus Tunisia is not what you generally expect from a, a, a tennis final. Now we know that Ariba Kina is actually Russian, but she declared for Kazakhstan and got support from them four years ago, and, and which is interesting because Russian and better Russian players are banned. But um, a bit of an even final so. Far? Yeah, um, Robbie Keane is, I think, had a bit of a nervy start, um, but has um, brought herself back into this. Jabir is a pretty awkward opponent. She's got a lot of variety um, the slice, the drop shots. Um, so, yeah, I think Robbie Keane was just kind of finding her feet. I think she was kind of a lot of people's favourites, even though she's uh, a little lower ranked. But as you say, born and raised in, in Moscow uh, and obviously the Russian and Belarusian players band. Um, but she was given a Kazakh passport and probably some funding a few years ago. Um, they have a big drive there to push tennis in Kazakhstan, have done for a number of years. So she is, uh, it could be quite ironic, you know, her being presented with the trophy by a member of the royal family here, having been, uh, you know, Russian background. Um, but let's see how it plays out the next half an hour or so. See, the establishment has been challenged by this uh, situation and also Nick Kyrgios tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, certainly. It's good to see, though, different names and faces, I yeah. think, uh, for the game. It's good for the game for, you know, the men's side and women's side. Obviously, the women's side has been wide open the last number of years since the kind of the end of the year of the Williams. So it's nice to see these different different players. Mario Rose is a toxic pal of mine and he's a tennis player and he always tells me that sometimes when you're in a set and it's going against you, you just maybe sometimes need to leave the set to save your energy. Is that the case? Because that's maybe was the deal with uh, Jabir there. Mario's a comedian not a tennis player. Yeah, Don't listen yeah, to him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm only joking. He, look, it, it, I think the, the perceived wisdom would be save your energy if you're five love down, five one down. But I think a lot of the greats, if you look like a Nadal or a Hewitt or a Williams, every point they're fully engaged and they don't kind of make that concession ever, even no matter what's happening on the scoreboard. So we didn't catch the very last game there because we were kind of getting mic'd up and coming in. I don't know if, if Jabir um, sort of let the last game slide to, to kind of keep the energy going for the third set. But uh, she's serving first here and down 30 love. Um, so could be a breakdown possibly early on here. When you were growing up, um, Jenny, who did you love in terms of women's tennis? Was it Steffi? Was it Monica Sellers? Was it... No, I was a few years after that. So uh, Kim Clijsters was the one who the Belgian. Was, yeah, she was the star in my eyes. I was always looking up to her. I kind of molded my game around how she played and also Williams kind of they were up and coming at that stage. And yeah, they, they were the players I kind of wanted to be like and play like and look like. And yeah. The bittersweet thing is you beat Ange Burr when you were young. Yeah, I played her no. nine years ago. Yeah. yeah so it was, uh, we were playing Fed Cup. Um, so we were playing over in Egypt and uh, we kind of hammered her 6 1 6 love. Right. So uh, that's my claim to fame. So I'm hoping that I can claim that I beat a Wimbledon champ. Because injuries kind of got in your way, didn't they? Unfortunately, yeah. Like I had a very short professional career, very successful, but very short. Um, I only managed to play maybe 14 months professionally um, and an elbow injury stopped that, in my, stopped me in my tracks very abruptly. Must have been tough because this was your life. Yeah, it was really tough because, you know, growing up, I had always wanted to be a professional tennis player. And from the age of four, like my mum's a tennis coach. So she kind of nurtured that within me and, and she gave me every opportunity I could to be the to be a professional tennis player. And my whole life was molded around and de dedicated to becoming a professional tennis player. And then unfortunately, I had a good few injuries in my teens. And then subsequently, yeah, that's what ended my professional playing career. And Connor, you also had a family background in tennis. Yeah, um, my, I was the youngest of four, um, so we uh, we lived across the road from Edge Baston Priory, which is a great tennis club in, in Birmingham. Um, my parents had moved over there for work for a few years, and uh, we moved back to Ireland then when I was three, and my sister was sort of number one in the UK, or number one or two in the UK under 12 at that point, so we were kind of a tennis family, and my mum had played, so uh, we had a court at home, um, and I played uh, 
you know, my brothers and sisters a pretty privileged uh, situation to be in, having not only the court at home, but 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 older and better siblings to be practicing with too. Um, so yeah, it, 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 it's a lot of this um, can be circumstance. You know, how you get, can get a little bit of a, a, an advantage and kind of keep it, keep keep it going through a career. Um, so yeah, it was uh, it was a great uh, it was kind of a great tennis upbringing for me as well. Would well, it be true to say, folks, we have a participatory tennis uh, industry or culture in this country, but not a competitive one? Yeah, I think, you know, tennis is widely played across Ireland, like um, as well as the likes of GAA and rugby. Like at grassroots level, there's probably similar enough am amount of players playing. It's just that then the progression through there to getting to the top or pr to be, become a professional, just the, the pathway is not necessarily as clear for that over here. It's a pastime more so than a... Yeah, I mean, I think I suppose a lot of people's definition of success is is sort of seeing the get seeing to Wimbledon, seeing on TV, <laughs> get to Wimbledon. Um, we have a lot of um, players like like Jack Jenny, um, guys like Simon Carr, who's out there at the moment, sort of five hundred in the world, made the last sixteen of the Junior US Open a few years ago. But because you're not seeing him on television, you kind of can can write off what they're doing. Mm -hmm. um, so. I mean, if he was if he was a Gaelic footballer, he'd be right at the very top. You know, I can guarantee in terms of the type of athlete and 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 um, with it's the a truly worldwide game. You see, this has. Is the thing. yeah. Um, so it's th that's the challenge we have. But I think what we lack is a a marquee professional event in the middle of the year that we used to have back in the sixties and seventies. We used to have the Irish Open on grass. Or, sorry, I think it was the week after Wimbledon, but you'd have Laver and Billie Jean King and these types of players coming and playing and winning. And I think when when we lost that. I think we lost that that showcase for the sport in Ireland, and and it gets pushed a little bit to the side. Then outside of the the two weeks of Wimbledon, um, and then below that again, we don't have an infrastructure of uh, professional world ranking events at the lower level to give your talented 16, 17 year olds a bit of a leg up to get started. So, you know, once you finish your um, your leaving cert, you know, you have to again get on a plane to go away for a month or, or six weeks to get um, tournaments abroad. Uh, if we had a run of four or five events like they do in, in every other country in Europe, um, that would really help uh, our youngers. And then below that again, um, a sort of a suite of junior events with world ranking points on offer would also attract foreign players to come over and play, which would expose our juniors to competitive opportunities against uh, international competition without having to spend the money to travel. So that would be a, a kind of, a, not an easy fix, but certainly a, a solution to it. Are there challenges around indoor facilities as well? Yeah, there's there's big issues here. I think only in really the last number of years there's more clubs with those dome like structures. Um whereas like down in Munster I think there's not even one single um indoor tennis court available. Like so it's very difficult considering we're a nation of rain that to, not to have, you know, those indoor facilities and the surface is also an issue then that we have here. Like we're playing on artificial grass and okay so there has been a push now for some more um clay courts being put in, but you know, not being able to play and train on the courts that you would be play competing on when you have to travel abroad. Is, is definitely a disadvantage as well. Because when golf, you can think of golf scholarships to the States. Is that something that you can avail of with tennis really? You need a lot of support. Do you financially, you almost need like a, a backer, do you? To... Yeah, I mean, I think like, we, we have a lot of, um, our, our best players will tend to take a scholarship to the US. That's what I did. Um, and it's definitely a legitimate pathway in golf to the very top of the game. In tennis, it seems less so. There's sort of maybe five or six in the top 100 in tennis who've, who've gone to college in the States, whereas with golf, it feels like it's maybe 90% seem to have done it. So um, a lot of our players, going back to your point on the participatory, if I've said that word right, um, they, they're a little bit one foot in, one foot out. You know, they're, we're big on our education. We, we, we try, we're trying to get 550 in the leaving. We're tr um, but like the, the best players in Europe and around the world and the Americans are, they're doing four hours a day training you know, at 14, From what, at 14 15, yeah. and then they're playing 20, 25 events a year. There's 52 weeks in a year, and half, every second one they're playing a tournament. You're not doing that when you're going to school from 9 to 4, Monday to Friday, and getting a week off in October, then you're back to school t till Christmas, you get two weeks off, you're back in January. <laughs> you know, so, so there's that more flexible kind of attitude, I think, in some of the other countries towards sport. Um, it, it, in Ireland, obviously, with the rugby, the GA, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the work that they do is built around the school day uh, and the school year and the school's competitions um, so it al they almost work a little bit like academies uh, you know sometimes look at some of the rugby schools it almost looks like maybe they're in in the morning doing the weights and maybe they're doing some training straight after school but it works a bit more like an academy setup that's something that you know, it, we're, we're, it's hard to know what the solution is on that 
you know, other than sending our best kids off at 13, 14 to Spain or Florida. Mm. The solution is intent and there's yeah. only so much of the pie to go around. Um, because what age were you? You beat Roger Federer when you were young. Yeah, um, I was uh, 12. It was the uh, the Winter Cup uh, event in Switzerland. We went over and played, uh, sorry, in France, we went over and played a match against Switzerland. I lost to their, their number one, who was a year older than, than me and, and, and Roger. And then we played a kind of a reverse singles match and I played, played Federer, so the same age. Uh, he was kind of not regarded as, obviously he was two in Switzerland at the time, but wasn't regarded as a very top level uh, junior in Europe at that age um, he kind of grew into his game he was playing a lot of he was quite aggressive quite an aggressive game style had some temper issues like a lot of us tennis players tend to do <laughs> it's, a, it's a difficult sport to about it are trying to manage the emotions on court in a match but uh, yeah played him and he went to the Swiss tennis academy at 14 you know and, and, and left school at 16 and I remember watching him when I was uh, I remember watching him win junior Wimbledon a couple of years later and obviously he was pretty much a full-time tennis player. Was it, so. the, was it the academy that made that um, It helped, yeah. yeah, he yeah. would, he, look at, it's not rocket science, if you train, if you play tennis for four hours a day um, and you play 20, 25 weeks a year tournaments, uh, you're going to get pretty good. <laughs> Yeah. So a few years later, when you're thinking, well, that, that's that's the guy I beat, Roger Federer. Like you, you, and he pops out of nowhere. Do you were, were you thinking to yourself, what am I, what am I doing? <laughs> what am I doing in my life? Uh, yeah, well, I was doing. I was in the middle of. I went to boarding school in England after my junior cert. Uh, did A levels, uh, and then went took a year off, and then went to college in the states. So I was, like I said, the phrase one foot in, one foot out. You know, yeah. want, trying to do the academics and. Um, and trying to do the athletics and it's hard to do both at the very very top level because they always talk about natural talent and Federer is the most naturally talented and gifted we've ever seen and all that kind of thing but maybe tennis is a sport that might be a bit more about repetition well it's definitely a game of repetition I say that to all my clients now when I'm coaching you know that it is a game of repetition but yeah but you got to put those hours in you know it's as it's kind of mentioned like four or five hours a day of training you need to be doing that and I have to say I went to an academy when I was 15 I moved to Spain went to academy and that made a huge difference to my game because I wasn't in school but I was training full time then so that gave me a real taste of what it was like to be a professional athlete and the Spanish system and the method that they go by is just so much repetition like and they feed a lot of balls and it's just hours and hours you're doing the same thing over and over again and it can be deemed monotonous but that's what's necessary I think to be the best um, but yeah I think it, their talent does have a part to play in that too like you can see players uh, kids even now with natural flair for it and, and you want to try and nurture that so there are some of those players who are like that but then also their hard work beats talent when talent doesn't work hard you also see with, even with, with, with a lot of the Irish coaches you can see when they're trying to work with the best performance players in Ireland when they're 14 or 15 they're trying to cram so much into the hour, hour and a half right. that they get with them yeah. and they're, you know, they've got ladders out they've got all sorts of equipment out yeah. because, and then you look at a Spanish coach they look so relaxed they've got the same drill it, you can only hit the ball cross quarter down the line go at it for a few hours in the sun on the clay and you know, we'll see who's the best at the end of the year um, so yeah they can kind of make it look easy what were the hardest skills to, you know, master, as it were? Is it the forehand, the backhand, the slice, the lob, the serve? Uh, just for somebody who doesn't know who's listening in. Oh, for me, I'd say the serve is probably the most technical part of the game, aspect of the game. And like there's the, the different ways to hit the serve. So you can hit a flat serve, a slice serve, a spin serve. So there's different parts in within the serve. Um, so the technique of that and then trying to nail down the accuracy because it's not necessarily always about having the most powerful serve. That obviously helps. But having that accurate serve that you can just pinpoint. The line. Um, yeah, hit the lines. like. It's a bit like the putting in golf, the serve, you know, it's sort of sometimes it's there one day and not the next, right. it's a bit more, uh, it's a t for me it was the same, the serve, and it's ironic because obviously growing up in, Ar up in Ireland we would have grown up on, a, on, a, on an AstroTurf court which plays quick and when it gets a little bit damp it plays really fast, which we would have thought would have uh, created a big service, but actually a lot of our players that get, um, you know, to the kind of professional level are often, actually often quite defensive style uh, players, if you kind of look back over the years. Um, but yeah, I suppose I was also, going back to the Federer match, he was sort of, I guess he was trying to develop weapons and he was playing quite aggressive tennis where when I was 12 and 13, quite results focused, Percentages. wanted to be the best in Ireland, wanted to win the nationals, trying to make a lot of balls. Don't work on your drop shot and your slice because it's, you know, it's low percentage. So a little bit short term thinking possibly as well. Um, so not developing that variety. You look at Ange Chapur there and what freedom and you know she's playing kind of off the cuff almost um, which can be really really tough to tough to deal with when you don't know what's ha what's coming at you from the other side. 
So what did Federer do to, you know, take off? And I know he's not won the most Grand Slams, but I think many people would think he's the best player to ever play the game. Certainly the best to watch. Um, I think I think Djokovic and Nadal uh, somewhat lamentably have probably um, surpassed him um, in terms of their, obviously the Grand Slams they've collected, but they wouldn't have gotten to that level if he hadn't set the set the tone in yeah. 05 and 06. So, um, yeah, I, I suppose, I think his serve is probably underrated as well. Uh, obviously a beautiful tennis player to watch, but his serve was had so much swing on it. He could hit the spots, like Jenny was saying. Um, he had the slice, he had the, 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 the flat serve as well. So, yeah, so much variety, which made a, I think was a, which kind of underpinned his career. Such grace as well. Yeah, he just made it look so effortless. I remember watching him live and thinking the way he moves around the court, he's just gliding around the court. He just made it just look so beautiful. Facing the serve, do you see the ball, or is it all about anticipation? Uh, is it about, you know because it just looks like for me, like I played, I played John Isner at a challenger. I played Ivo Karlovic who were, uh, at Davis Cup, which are you know, six foot ten, six foot eleven, um, and it was the angles that they were able to generate. I think that's why they got they've collected so many aces. Um, I, there's, there's a couple of guys like Sam Groth as well, who I think had the fastest ever, sort of one one six two. I think it was his fastest ever, but it was at a challenger event, so it's not officially recorded. Um, generally, what I what, what I did was I would just try and block those. Anybody who served maybe higher than 130 miles an hour, you just sit there and block it. So you just take a little stab at the pole, try and get it deep somehow. Um, but it's really hard. It's really frustrating. Like watching Murray play Isner. Um, a couple of weeks ago, uh, or whatever it was, was it last Tuesday or Wednesday, he was just getting so frustrated because he just can't get any rhythm. Um, and when you're sort of a baseline, you thrive on rhythm and time. Is that why Goran, for example, was so successful? Though? He only won one Grand Slam, but a Wimbledon, you know, ace after ace after ace. Yeah, in incredible. And again, with that lefty slice, kind of, also I think the grass played a little bit quicker. Um, back in the early uh, 2000s and 90s. I'm not sure whether they changed the grass um, uh, condition of it or whatever, but it seems to play a lot slower these days. Um, but yeah, it was just, it was a lot slicker and with his lefty slider, it was just, uh, yeah, it was devastating. Yeah, but if you look at Kyrgios as well, like his, he's making his service games look so easy now in Wimbledon this week and these last two weeks, you know, he's just flying through them so quickly and that's a big part to play then obviously in his success um, and we'll see how he gets on tomorrow. But unlike, uh, un sorry, in the women's game, the serve then it tended to be not as big a weapon. Right. The, the returning game used to be very strong. I remember that, um, like you'd be under pressure under your, on your service games because the girls would just come in and step in and take it so early. Uh, so you had more of a chance to break. So I remember playing matches and you're breaking serve every game, getting to 5-4 and then really desperately trying to cling on to hold, to hold on to serve. It's the opposite, it's inverse. Yeah, it was, yeah. For At the moment, Reba Keen is 3-1 up in the final set against Anzia Burr in this Wimbledon final. She was a set down. Wow. So Anzia Burr is the one under pressure now. So the psychology of this now, the psychology of playing a match, uh, how much are you living in your own head when you're playing these big matches? I've never had the privilege, neither of us, unfortunately, to, to be that that level where you're, you know, I think it's obviously when I when I played Wimbledon, I was I was trying to get over the line in the first round to get on to centre court, which uh, it de definitely you feel a, feel a different type of a pressure, um, and then I think you can probably add twenty percent on to trying to to close out a Wimbledon. Um, it's amazing how often the top players deal with it and get through it because. If you if you go out to a professional tennis tournament, you might take for granted somebody's up five three or five four. They're going to serve it out comfortably, but the amount of times somebody gets broken at the lower levels trying to serve out a set. But when you watch it on TV, the top guys just serve it out. There's just such good closers. There's such good finishers. I think it's kind of an underrated element. And again, we're watching it so often. We think that's routine for them. But at, even when you get down to 100 in the world, 200 in the world, the guys are are losing serve trying to serve out the match all the time. It happens a lot. You're one two nine in the world is what you got to. Yeah, that's the high uh, the highest ranking. So uh, yeah, it's a number that that stays with you, and uh, yeah, you, you kind of cling on to it. You know, this was what 2011 when you got to Wimbledon and the U.S. Open. Yeah, it was. Uh, I'd, I'd had a had a really good year in 2010, and it was one two nine was was my ranking at the end of of 2010. Um, but I was staying in Australia uh, and was getting a lot of pain in my hip and got an MRI and they basically, me and Jenny were talking off air, she has no cartilage left in her elbow, I have no cartilage left in my hip. So um, yeah, I was uh, taking, getting cortisone shots just to get me through kind of three, four months at a time. Um, and that uh, 2011 then I was, it was funny, I kind of peaked 
um, probably because I, I pared back my schedule a little bit because I wasn't um, as focused on the ranking points and I was just focused on trying to get some good performances because I knew I was sort of in trouble and was going to have to get surgery sooner rather than later. So, uh, yeah, kind of peaked at, uh, at Wimbledon and US Open that year and, um, and then towards the end of 2011 knew I was going to have to get surgery um, and knew then that wouldn't entail a sort of six, seven months off, my ranking going down, me having to start again. So I ended up stopping in 2011, or sorry, 2012, getting surgery uh, and then not coming back. The Wimbledon experience, so? Yeah, it was, it was, it was so special. The, the three matches in qualifying the week before, uh, which were off-site uh, in, a, in a cricket ground called Roehampton Tennis Club, um, but loads of you know a few more people from Limerick every round. Sort of, <laughs> there was maybe two of the first round, oh, eight. Yeah. And then there was about thirty for the final, um, and yeah, it was it was it was amazing to be able to share share the experience because obviously I'm playing uh, at Jenny playing tournaments around the world. Uh, you might travel with a coach or a family member, but your friends never get to see you play. You know, and they kind of almost don't quite. They don't know what th that standard sort of looks like. So, but for them to be able to sort of share it with you, see what you do. Um, and then carry that through to the main draw and, and the, the big dance was was brilliant. Yeah, amazing. And you just have to put that in your mind, I suppose, it just nearly was there. You were going to play Federer in the second round. And just not. Yeah, so... Uh, the revenge match. Again, it sounds like Jenny was interviewing me on the outside <laughs> and I was interviewing her, but Tell we were saying it. earlier that, yeah, you kind of have to almost trick yourself and just say, listen, it was a great experience. I'm glad it happened. I could easily... I was down match points in qualifying. Could easily not have happened. Um, but I was able to, to play it. And as I say, you can, might say to somebody, you're one two nine in the world, uh, but it's hard for them to kind of know exactly what that looks like. But if you say I played Wimbledon, played US Open, which was a month later, it. yeah, 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 it was I guess yeah late August. So it was maybe yeah nearly two months later. Um, and I you did get on to the big stage. There. Yeah, yeah, qualified and played uh, and had um, my, my I was out at, a, at dinner and, and my phone started pinging and all these people just saying Djokovic, Djokovic, Djokovic. So I was like, okay, the draw is obviously out. And uh, yeah, was was drawn against Djokovic on the Tuesday uh, on, on on Arthur Ashe, uh, the biggest court in tennis. So I was like, oh, I you know, it's it's karma has kind of come back and I'm getting my chance to play on the biggest court. And uh, I got food poisoning and couldn't couldn't play my best tennis, but got out for an hour and. Uh, and did okay, um, so yeah, it was a, a bit of a, a bit of a wild summer. <laughs> no, that was so unfair, Connor. <laughs> yeah, it was tough. It was tough to take. Um, again, I thought I was able to just you know park the Wimbledon thing, and and it, it did take quite a bit out of me for the few months after, to be honest. And and going back to the to the challenger circuit, I suppose, knowing I had this hip injury um, and and not having kind of yeah been able to maybe enjoy it. But it's a, it's a decent story at least, you know. Was Novak Djokovic sympathetic? Um, he kind of stared blankly at me, to be honest, when I when I right. walked, when I went up to him. So, um, like when 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 you retire as a tennis player, um, you know you kind of have to obviously go up and explain yourself and you know, why you're why you're finished up. And the, the opponent generally goes through a sort of a bit of a pantomime. Oh, I'm really sorry, and I don't like to win like this. And um, but he just I just said, look, I've been sick for a couple of days, uh, and he just stared blankly at me. Um, and uh, it was strange, and, he, uh, and then that was it. We just kind of shook the open bump bar his hand. Um, but then I did see him at Aussie Open in January. Um, obviously, wouldn't have been playing the same tournaments as him, as him for the rest of the year. And uh, I walked into the locker room. He looked up, and he said, "Oh, hey!" And he, I could tell he recognised me. He goes, "Are you feeling better?" <laughs> <laughs> well, I said, "Yeah, I was feeling better about like, two days <laughs> later." Uh, so yeah, pretty funny. What is the circuit like when you're when you're meeting these people that like you're you're against them and you're in a locker room with them and is it a closed circuit or is it very much an individual sport? Well, I think like you're, what you're seeing on the TV is like the top, you know, the ATP, WGA circuit. Like then below that, then is like challenger level. So you're, it's not necessarily as glamorous looking as right. as this is at all. There may not even be a locker room when you go to tournaments. <laughs> um, but being amongst like the players, you're in the hotels and and restaurants. So I find that it to be that people kind of stuck to themselves quite a lot. Um, it wasn't the most friendly place to be and especially when I joined, you know, I joined the professional tour at 24 so I was fairly developed, you know, um, I was my own person at that stage and found that quite difficult to try and break in and meet people and even the very first day I got to a tournament, like trying to find someone to practice with. It's a lonely existence. Yeah, it is really tough. Like Connor mentions as well there, like you, you don't travel generally with a big entourage like you see with these guys here on the TV. You're either with your coach or alone and I 
predominantly travels alone in the beginning because at the start you just don't have the funding to, to be able to pay a coach to go with you. So it is really tough. Like, you know, you, you want to be able to f- go out there and, and feel like you, you know what you're doing. But the first day I turned up, I hadn't a clue what to do, how to book a court, how to get tennis balls, how to organise someone to play with, all that kind of stuff. You know, you have to figure that out fairly quickly. And it's a tough existence. Yeah, the practice thing is ridiculous because you're usually going over as the only Irish person, but there might be maybe four French players over there and they're going to practice together um, and they don't necessarily want to let you in like yeah. they'd be fairly switched on to to know he looks quite good but also he looks he looks new she looks yeah. new i'm yeah. not gonna i'm not gonna welcome them with open arms um so trying to build up those relationships is hard and i think when you've been on maybe the junior grand slam circuit a lot of those players might might have started to play those at 15, 16, and they do, you do build up relationships and friendships. And in fairness, one thing I've noticed, uh, maybe more also on the women's side, uh, in the last kind of couple of years, is it seems like there is a little bit more empathy and uh, yeah. relationships that seem to have developed um, between players and friendships that maybe you didn't see as much in the 90s and, and, and the 2000s. So uh, just something I've, I've kind of picked up on, it seems like, watching watching the circuit over the last couple of years. I don't know if you've re- recognised that as well. Or? Yeah, well, in an individual sport, you know, it's every man and woman for themselves. So everyone is out there to try and be the last woman man standing at the end of the week. So there is that. There is that very much, that single-minded, driven focus. But, yeah, you do see now, like you see Jabur and Maria there, they're best pals. And yeah, she brought right. out in the court was was wonderful there um, in the semi-final so it is good to see that you know I suppose they're they're established um, and when you're when you're at the futures level challenge level the goal is to get out of there as quick as you can um, so it's probably even more dog eat dog in some ways because these guys are they know if um, you know they're, they're going to they're going to win their tournaments make their money and and, and kind of get their ranking no matter what once they get to that level it's based on on performance yeah. Um, but yeah it's a it's a challenging environment Anybody with a tennis question for Conan Ireland or um, Jenny Claffey, you can text us 53106. Uh, Ange and uh, Elena Ribakina are involved in the deciding set of the Wimbledon Women's Singles Final. Oh, and is it? We're trying to do commentary here. 4 <laughs> 2. Ariba Kina is now only two games away from winning her first Grand Slam title. Um, the injury, uh, Jenny, was it just devastating, surely? Absolutely, yeah, heartbreaking. You know, at the time I didn't understand maybe the severity of of what the doctor was saying at the time. I was, was telling Connor there that you know the first meeting I had with the doctor, he said like this is this is pretty much it. You know, I'm not sure there's anything I can do for you in terms of you continuing to play tennis. But alas, he tried, and and I had two surgeries later to no avail. I wasn't able to go back and play. And then um, two years later, two years after that, I went back to see him, and he was like, if by the time you're you're the age of 35, you want to be able to you know, lift your kids or go to the gym I wouldn't ever touch a weight or touch a tennis racket ever again with your right arm Wow! so you know it came very abruptly because as I and was it was it be- was it because of tennis that you got the injury yeah it was a repetitive strain injury and overuse so but I remember like as I said I mentioned I joined the tour in 2015 and I had great success over a very short period of time and obviously increased the load of training and match play and the pressure and the tightness you're holding in your arm and whatnot um, and then had an off season and then came back in 2016 to play and kind of had this niggle in the arm but like as an athlete you get used to playing with pain and you generally tend to ignore it unless it becomes too bad and that's subsequently what happened you know six months later of playing with the arm I ended up not being able to lift my arm and it was completely stuck in, in like with 20 degrees off straightening and then I realised okay I better do something about this um, and remember going to a tournament and I hadn't practiced serving for about a month because it was too painful and knew that that kind of going into that tournament that this was the last hurrah for me um, and, and went to meet that doctor and then yeah unfortunately So not just the physical injury but the psychological injury Yeah that was really that was probably the tougher part you know because as I said I didn't realise the severity of it going into it and then you know a year later two surgeries later then it kind of dawned on me that this was it it was all over and then I had a huge identity crisis you know who is, who is Jenny Claffey without tennis and this you know I shot to great success very quickly and then it was like where what am I going to do now and where do I go and you know that was a really really tough time psychologically and support networks did you um, have to be very vigilant to avoid negative supports yeah well at the time then you know I kind of developed a bit of a team around me and um, my you know two coaches the physical trainer and a sports psychologist at the time as well and they were great in that transition but then you know over time they have to go back to their own lives and you know earn a living and whatnot is there a grief process to it 
I definitely went through a grief process after it. Yeah, yeah. I dealt with it through going to with, you know, chatting through with my sports psychologist. And um, I ended up doing a course in sports psychology because I was so fascinated about, you know, that how do you overcome something like this and what do, like athletes, what we go through as athletes and just trying to get a better understanding of all of that. And that actually really helped me process it and grieve the, grieve the loss. And when you call it quits, did oh, you have any <laughs> 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 uh, Yeah, I think... Um, were yeah, you, you, I was. I was honestly. I, I felt a bit of freedom, a bit of relief, uh, to be honest. And I think going back to what I was saying about those guys who are maybe going full time at fourteen, fifteen. I think the benefit of obviously me having finished school and going to college meant I wasn't, um, yeah, really kind of wrestling with who I was and, and that. I'd a bit, been a pro t- player for about seven, eight years, but had had that college experience. I felt like my going back into into normal life was was an okay transition for me so I don't didn't have a really tough um a really tough time of it thankfully um but but when I was on the tour as I say that was probably you know the times where I felt like that's where you, where I needed the supports around me and I never traveled kind of alone I, you know would have done a few weeks when I first came out of college when I was still finding my feet and I realized after sort of a summer from a tennis perspective first and foremost you need feedback you know in terms of what you're doing um, and and obviously then you need somebody to practice with, somebody to feed you balls when you're working on something. Expensive business. It, it, yeah, it, it is. Was it's it a extreme. struggle to make it pay? Uh, yeah, so you can only, you're kind of breaking even when you get to about two two fifty in the world. You're may, may, making a little bit of money when you're top hundred, uh, but anything below that, you're you're kind of mo- losing money hand over fist. Especially if you want to do it right with a coach or. God forbid, a, f- a physio or somebody to keep your, your body in check as well. So um, I had a private sponsor for, a, for my first year or two out of the tour. Um, and then, um, yeah, I was kind of able to, to pretty much ma- you know, break even, I suppose, because my ranking was sort of, I was making qualified Grand Slams. Prize money was pretty decent, but I, I wasn't able to retire off the winnings, unfortunately. Are you, you know, Jenny's a coaching, obviously. Yeah. Are you coaching? Are you involved in the game in any way? I'm the Davis Cup captain, yeah. so uh, we're away to, to Barbados um, in September, which will be nice. Will you uh, play any tennis? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I made the lads play anyway. I'm, I'm non playing captain, but um, we, we, had a, we got a walkover against China, uh, believe it or not, in February. So when, since the Gerard PK sort of new ownership structures come in, we used to only play against countries from Europe or North Africa, but they've kind of ripped up the, the whole Davis Cup program and it's all a little bit up in the air so uh, yeah we, we were torn against China they couldn't host because of the COVID lockdown we were given a walk over and then it was uh, I think it was down to either Dominican Republic or Barbados for us to, to for who we're going to be playing in September so that's a, that's a match to go to group one uh, next year so hopefully that goes well Three minutes before the break and uh, I don't know if we're going to get through this uh, with Elaine Arie-Bakina now three points away from winning her first ever Wimbledon title her first Grand Slam title so she's five games to two up against Anne Jabeur in the third set here at Wimbledon uh, so Jabeur won the first set by six games to three Arie-Bakina won the second set by six games to two and now she's five two up serving for the championship as they call it at Wimbledon so exciting no stuff No pressure they Don't need a roof there She's been so calm and collected this whole tournament. It's unbelievable. I wonder was, was she, she going to be able to? Yeah, she gives nothing away. You know, she she and she she plays really well on the grass. She she always does well Powerful, in the colour one tournaments. Yeah, she, I don't know what what is she six two or she's she's, she's got a big serve and um, yeah, big game. Yeah, the head of the Kazakh. Uh, Tennis Federation is uh, an Irishman, believe it or not, Dave Miley. Um, so I can't see him in the players' box there, but I'm sure he's getting very excited somewhere, somewhere on the grounds today. They never had a Grand Slam winner. As I say, you know, it was it's been a relatively recent thing. In fairness, they are they are Russian players. Their Davis Cup team are uh, are, are guys who were born and raised in Russia, but they've been given these um, th- this Kazakh citizenship and are obviously um, spreading the spreading the, the, the name of the country, I suppose. It's the funding they're receiving. That's quite yeah. a conservative rally here. And Jabir has bounced yes. back to lead uh, 30 points to 15. And uh, but we're now in the eighth game of the, the final set. So Reba Kina, five uh, games to two. We're going to break away from that because um, otherwise we'll, be, we'll, we'll actually miss the news and it'll probably be a juice. But uh, Westmead won eight, uh, Cavan nine points in the Talton Cup final. We're here with Conor Ireland and Jenny Claffey speaking about tennis. Any kind of questions you want to get through on 53106 for a cost of 30 cent? Going to look ahead to Novak Djokovic and uh, Nick Kyrgios and talk a bit about the future of tennis in this country after four, between four and 4.20 with... Uh, Elena Ribakina serving for the championship against Angebur at Wimbledon. We're back after the news here on Off the Ball. Stay with us.
And you're welcome back to Off the Ball Saturday here on News Talk. John Duggan with you through to five o'clock. We're talking about tennis of Wimbledon with two Irish stars of the game, the former number ones, Connor Nyland and Jenny Claffey. And Elena Rybakina has won Wimbledon, the women's singles. She has beaten Angevin in three sets, three six six two six two. And Jenny, there was literally no reaction. Uh, she's almost so stunned that she's won Wimbledon. Uh, the Kazakh, uh, obviously Russian, now to, playing for Kazakh. Stan, Elena Rubikina, she's about to get her silver. Yeah, what a very underwhelming response when she won Wimbledon. We were expecting to see the heroics of the hands in the air falling onto the ground, you know, very disappointing. It's the best part. Yeah. It's the celebration. The you know, celebration. She just, I thought she was going to change ends. Yeah. <laughs> it's quite confusing, to be honest. But, and uh, the crowd went not wild because she didn't herself. She's uh, got the Venus Rosewater dish in her hand there, um, Women's Singles Champion. Jabir just, it just kind of went against her in the last two sets. It looked as though like Rubikina didn't get off to the best start uh, there. Jabour was kind of throwing everything at her and then she settled obviously in the second set and then tried the third set there. We didn't really get to see as much of it but it looked like Rubikina kept kept her dominance there and was overpowering Jabour. Was she tipped for greatness, uh Rubikina? Yeah, I think Rubikina has been a name that has been mentioned um, before COVID. Like in 2020, she had reached like the final of four titles, four finals. Um, so she was and she was only 20 at the time so she was kind of tipped for good things and then she, through illness and injury over the last few years and obviously then COVID she hasn't come into her form but maybe this is the start and this is the start of the future of the game The irony that a, a Russian I know she's playing for Kazakhstan uh, Connor, but Russians and Belarusians are banned from Wimbledon and now she's uh, picked up the trophy Yeah, they, there's t- 25 Russians and Belarusians who weren't allowed to play which obviously opened up the draw a little bit and, and we obviously had some some kind of new names there in the in, in the semi-finals and finals, but now to have, um, yeah, uh, born and raised um, Rubikina from Russia, it is it is ironic. Um, but uh, listen, she's a she's a, a, an unbelievable player, and, and, and as Jenny said, the last few weeks as well, she's been putting together some really good stuff on the grass. So uh, she, I think, she would have been in amongst it even with a full draw. Um, but can, yeah. can we claim an Irish uh, win here? <laughs> yeah, so so yeah, Dave, Dave Miley is uh, is I don't know what the official title, but essentially he's kind of running um, Kazakh tennis of the last couple of years. So uh, it's uh, it's a pretty pretty awesome uh, thing for for him today. Mm-hmm. Sue Barker is getting the tears, I think, out of Angebur there, Jenny. Yeah, well, no doubt, like, what a huge um, moment for Jabur, you know, to be in a women's final for the first time and all the pressure and expectation being the, the first Arab woman, an African woman in a final. And I think, you know, people kind of backed her to win this. Um, she was my outside favourite from the start, even though she was... You said third. that on OTBAM. I watched back the interview and you said uh, Jabur for the outside for the women's and Kyrgios for the men's. <laughs> I got so close, but now let's hope Kyrgios can uh, emulate Jabir and win tomorrow and I get something right at least. 53106, waiting 30 minutes for you to ask them who they think will win the men's final. Well, text her, like, you know, there's only the, the whole, uh, the future of Irish tennis to be decided here. <laughs> in, in hour, you know. Um, it is it, it is a fascinating, like you're talking about the establishment here and um, Reba Keane and the Russian uh, aspect. Nick Kyrgios, like he, he is John McEnroe on steroids when it comes to villainy. <laughs> And pantomime villainry. He is, but I think like it's funny if you look at Mark and Rob, Obviously, yeah, he was he was um, he was the villain when he was playing, but now he basically he's their lead commentator. He's the head pundit. When you think of Wimbledon, you think of John McEnroe, and I think it's turning a little bit for Curios. I think he's um, obviously the allegations that have come out this week have, have framed it, but there was uh, sort of a level of nearly affection starting to turn for him as well. Even though, despite all the madness, I think you know you're going to get entertained, um, and I think. We're disappointed there isn't a Djokovic Nadal final because it's just what would be at stake in terms of the Grand Slam tally. But I think a Djokovic curious final is is very exciting, um, and he he's been re- very rested the last few days. I think he hasn't played in four days, which I think is so, in some ways probably a challenge um, in terms of getting your uh, your your match tightness and and ha- that energy right. Um, so it'll be interesting to see. But Djokovic has been good, but he's going to be. I don't think, I, as it stands, I'm pretty sure he can't play U.S. Open um, with the with the COVID vaccine situation. Plus, Australia. obviously, there's the Australian ban as well. So he's at 20 slams, Natal's at 22. He's going to try and catch him to 21, and then he's maybe going to not get a chance to to, to get to add to that tally till next summer. So he's had a really weird year. So I don't think he, it's going to be straightforward situation for him on Sunday. If Kyrgios can get the crowd on his side somehow, even though he's the bad boy. Um, it could be it could be tough, tough for Djokovic. 
It's amazing. Like every single day in January, the whole world is talking about Novak Djokovic and can he get into Australia or not? And it was not only about the tennis players, about freedom, it's about COVID, it's about everything, it's about all of us being our heads melted. Uh, to me, it feels like 10 years ago. Yeah, it's been a long year, I think, and Djokovic has had very up and down results this year. Um, I, I'm not the, the biggest Djokovic fan, so I'm disappointed to see him in the final, but expected him to be there and expect him Is to. Is it that because of the COVID situation? It's because he didn't sympathise with me when I was sick. Yeah, him. exactly. He only <laughs> said six months later to Connor, how are you feeling? Yeah, yeah. Never forgive him. <laughs> that was, what, 11 years ago? Yeah, I just think, you know, uh, he's just not that a likeable guy. I think he tries a little bit too hard. Um, I'm he not blew so a kiss to a heckler, uh, or, you know, yes. sarcastically blew a kiss to a heckler at the end of the Nari match yesterday. When he won yesterday. Which yeah. went down like a lead balloon, to be honest. The, the crowd started to boo. You know what? You can't buy affection and love. It has to be given to you. True. Look at Federer, like how well adored he is in Wimbledon and, and all across the world anyway. But then Djokovic just doesn't have that same, you know, fan base or he just doesn't have that about him. Like we mentioned empathy, he certainly doesn't have that. And and I think, you know, in the last few years, like he's, he's done some things maybe that haven't gone in his favour, you know, hitting a line judge with a ball and getting um, kicked out of the US Open. That stupid tour he did at the start of COVID. Like and everyone got COVID. Yeah. yeah, so there's just a few, you know, black marks, I think, across his name and um, he just maybe doesn't have that likability. But we cannot, you know, not mention how amazing of, of an athlete and a tennis player that he is. And, and that's why he's in this position that he is. Uh, one thing I, I do think uh, to myself, and maybe I'm a, I'm a cynic and I'm not trying to cast aspersions here, uh, Connor, but these guys seem to go on forever. Like, uh, like our matches that go on for hours, they're in their mid 30s. He's 35 now. Nadal is, what, uh, 36. Federer came back. Um, are they taking lots of legal supplements? I imagine they probably are, yeah. They probably are walking the, not walking the line, but that they, that they are taking what's available to them. Um, but I think they are. They've probably been doing that and, and looking after themselves now for, for 20 odd years. Um, the teams that they build around them as well are incredible. I mean, Natal was talking about he played the final of the French with basically an anaesthetised foot. He said, my foot was put to sleep for the final. Um, I don't know what that means yeah. <laughs> in some ways, but um, yeah, I think I think in Natal's case, he seems to be able to, to just suffer through matches you know, with incredible pain, he had that. It was confirmed he had that was seven, seven millimeter tear in his abdominal muscle. I think that would have probably done everybody else in the world in, but he managed to not only keep going but find a way to to actually win that match. Um, Djokovic, you know, I think he's practically at the yoga master level of flexibility at this stage. He's just he's so flexible. Um, so I think. I think we've seen that maybe across a lot of sports. Maybe 32, 33 was the turning point for an athlete. 15, 20 years ago, it looks like maybe it's 35, 36, 37 now. And obviously Federer has become less in the conversation now that he's hit 40. When it comes to Kyrgios, I would be always thinking to myself, this guy's just a carnival. Um, you know, he's just a pantomime guy. Um, back it up and win a slam. But does he actually have talent? He's 27 years of age now. No doubt he has talent. A massive serve, probably top two or three in the game. Um, I think he's been really fortunate to self find himself in a final right. here. He's had a Nadal semi-final. Uh, walk over, he had Christian Garin, you know, a good, solid 30, 30 in the world clay court guy in the quarterfinals. What happened was, I think it was Berrettini that was in his quarter who got COVID, who won the two grass court warm up events. So he's had a really good uh, draw. He did go and beat Sitsipas, but Sitsipas results on grass the last years haven't been great, and he's a little bit vulnerable at the moment, Sitsipas, since he lost that grand, uh, Roland Garros final a couple of years ago to Djokovic. So, yeah, he, he, I, I always felt like he was a third, fourth round guy and then would come up against one of the big boys um, and he just, he's just he been able to avoid that this tournament, but he could win it. He could win it. Is there any re reason why it would be any different tomorrow then against Djokovic? No, I think he's gonna. we're going to see a spectacle tomorrow. Like I'm going to get the popcorn out for this final tomorrow because I reckon we're going to see you know, a very two very different uh, players on either side of the net. Um, I don't I think we have any reason to doubt Kyrgios except maybe the fact he, you know, it's his first Grand Slam final. He's never experienced something like this. He's had a few days to mull over it now, obviously, because he had the, the, the walkover by Nadal. Um, but he's got nothing to lose. He's going to go out there and I reckon he'll try every trick he has against Djokovic, try to get under his skin. Gamesmanship. Definitely, yeah. He'll definitely try to get under Djokovic's skin, which is going to be pretty tough because Djokovic is, you know, steely-like. Um, but I think that Kiras is going to gonna throw everything at him tomorrow. And as I said, like, he's got no pressure on him, really. Um, nothing to lose and everything to gain. Where do, how do you kind of, when you're thinking about Connor, given you played at the top level, um, 
Nadal, Federer, Djokovic, the, the who's the best thing? How do you make a determination around that? It's become a little bit easier, I suppose, that Natal's put a bit of daylight at 22 to 20 um, slams now. But I, each Although, of them at their best, for example. Yeah, it, it's 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 so hard because, I mean, you're talking surfaces as well. But I think yeah. Natal's put up, what is it, 14 of, of the 22 on, on clay, which is probably, you know, a little bit skewed. I think we probably underrate, underrate how dominant and good Djokovic has been on grass. Okay. I think we probably think we'll give the grass one to Federer and, and Djokovic is the hardcore guy because he's won so many Aussies and that. But I think... I think he's on a 37 match win streak on Central. He's going for a or something. F- fourth in a row, fourth yeah, in title. Yeah, you know, you don't, he barely has ever lost on that court. So um, it's hard to say, but I mean, I think, I think if Nadal ends up with the most slams, you have to give it to him. But I think um, there's, a lo- there's other metrics we can look at. Um, and I think Djokovic has been world number one now for maybe six, seven years. So, it, you know, it's hard, if, you're, if slam, slam tallies are only, you're only kind of. Um, metric then it's then it's Nadal for me uh, 110 for Westmead 11 points for Cavan in the Talton Cup final um, we have 53106 text messages really enjoying listening to your guests thank you uh, I was a big Bjorg and Borg fan back in the day just wondering what the guys think of him as a player I don't enjoy the tennis so much now I uh, can't wait for the footies to be back <laughs> Bjorn Borg big tennis fan there <laughs> <laughs> Bjorn Bjorn Borg yeah sorry a little bit a little, little bit before my times oddly I think he's such an iconic player uh, he, he seemed to to strike a chord with so many players, sorry, so many people, and inspired so many people to play tennis. I think that McEnroe Borg, you know, if you ever get in a taxi, you know, it's sort of the, it's the Borg McEnroe uh, conversation yeah. as much as the Nadal. So that's a lot about personalities, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, I think it was the cool Swede and the, yeah. the hothead New Yorker, and, and it definitely, I think it was the perfect rivalry back then, you know. And also, he just walked away. Which is, which is, yeah, 26, wasn't it? So, uh, so young. I think he was, yeah, he obviously internalized so much. He didn't give anything away on court, but I think it probably just, it probably wore him down a little bit in the end. 53106, Kyrgios's behavior towards officials and balls, boys, and when he's losing, shows he's nothing more than a bully. Hopefully, Djokovic beats him to love, says Dave. Um, is clay the hardest surface to play on? I didn't particularly like clay. Um, my game was suited definitely to a more of a, a faster surface. Like I enjoyed the hard court more. You know, I liked big serve, big forehand. So I liked to be a little bit more aggressive. Whereas on clay, you had to bide your time, be a little bit more patient. Rally was long, rallies were longer. I think you could get away with a, a less lesser game on clay almost like some of the girls would produce results on a, on clay court that then may not produce any results on, on the other surfaces um, so yeah I think clay is definitely probably the most physically taxing as well you know in terms of the, the longevity of the rallies etc and yeah um, yeah, for me I'd say probably it's clay Yeah it's the most specialised because of the movement um, you have to learn to slide into the ball and time those slides unless you've grown up on clay which we obviously wouldn't have done it, 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 you know, you almost never kind of catch up with the guys who've maybe been playing on it since they were seven or eight. So, um, yeah, it was always a challenge. And the other thing is, a lot of pro events, certainly at the futures level, are on clay. And we would have grown up maybe on artificial grass, and there's virtually zero uh, artificial grass. So, uh, it's an amazing surface to go and learn your tennis on, though. So, you know, if you're 15, you know, if you're going to an academy, go find some clay courts to train on because. Half an hour of tennis on a clay court, you could hit twice as many balls as half an hour on a, say, a grass court. Just because the ball bounces that much higher, it's just uh, it's harder, harder to put the ball away on a clay court. And that's why we have now got some more clay courts around Ireland because obviously it's such a great surface to learn your skill set on. And um, you can do so much more variety. Like you can bring in the drop shots. You know, you learn how to play defensive balls. There's just a little bit more skill involved, I think, on a, on a clay court as, as well as the physical side, as we mentioned. So you're coaching now, Jenny. Say if somebody is a young person. Like even at a very young age and you realise, God, they're really good. What is the pathway? Yeah, I think there we run into trouble very quickly with that. Do you know, um, I mentioned a few weeks ago, I, I have a, a player who's who I'm coaching who's nine years old and now, and you're going, okay, he's saying he wants to be a professional tennis player. He has a lot of good skills. He can do a lot with the ball. Um, and it's like, where do we go now? And, you know, at nine years old, you're not going to ship him off to Spain to a tennis academy and move away from your family. Like, that's not an option. So that's definitely highlighting the issue we kind of have here in Ireland where it's not there's not a clear pathway for players who show that um, talent and flair 
player at that age as to where they go you know at that stage they need to be playing and practicing uh, like you know five six times a week and then they need to be doing the physical side of it and they also need to be playing match plays and that's just something then we're kind of lacking a little bit here of that that um, amount of tournaments and then the depth as well of players like for are there that many good nine year olds that can train together or, or a little bit older you know where you have that option for him to progress within a system we just don't really have that here because I would have read Andre Agassi's book and it's one of the best books ever written in sport and uh Nick Bolletieri, uh, you you ended up in this academy was it for a couple of weeks? Yeah, we went over for for two weeks, um, and yeah, Nick was there. Uh, the Williams sisters, Andy Roddick. Uh, it was a great great two weeks. Myself and and, and Stephen Nugent were kind of number one and two in Ireland in our age group. We went over and practiced with them, and Nick was there. And yeah, like it's a lot easier to play three four hours a day when it's sunshine and, and palm trees at the back of the court as well. Like it's hard. Um, you know, to be getting up in the middle of winter in Ireland, maybe at seven in the morning to get your two hours in, it is a little bit easier when, in the when, in the warmer climates. But uh, yeah, Nick, I think just he was that academy that he set up, that academy system. He was the first to do it. You know, get all these good players in the one place, train them really hard, good coaches, and and basically it's sink or swim. You know, can you can you live with doing four or five hours a day, five six days a week, um, and the ones that could. You know, went on to to be to be world class players. Like Sharapova was there when I was there, and she was about nine. She'd moved over from um, from Russia with her with her parents, um, with a view to being a tennis player even at that age. So it's it's kind of what it takes to be at that top top level. It seems that unless you're an industry uh, for tennis, you need a lot of money behind you. Yeah, I mean, it's you know, your national federations like your Wimbledon's, like the the Lawn Tennis Association in the UK now will get I think thirty million pounds from Wimbledon alone and they get that every year it's called the Wimbledon surplus so they get that money in and they can they can obviously put it towards coaching tournaments travel with of coaches to with players you name it um which obviously we don't have that luxury but I think the lower hanging fruit for fruit for us is putting on those those weekend events like when I was 10 11 12 I used to go over in the winter time for weekend events in the UK um so I'd fly over on a Friday two singles matches on a Saturday two on a Sunday fly back on Sunday in school for Monday, um, and that was through September, you know, to May, and we still don't have a really good weekend kind of tournament schedule. It's gotten slightly better in the last year or two, but those those little mini tournaments, we need them all the time. Like if you look at the soccer and the Celtic football, you train during the week, you've a match at the weekend, whereas in tennis it's a bit like you train from September to May and you've matches it's in the summer. summer. Yeah, <laughs> it's like yeah. it's a long way to wait when you're nine and ten, you know. Well, there's the pathway you're saying there is very costly to become in a professional tennis player like you know you rely heavily on your family um, as a, obviously as a kid you do but then as, as you be turn professional you know you're looking to your nearest and dearest to help out I remember when I joined the tour there in 2015 I wrote to the top 200 com companies in Ireland looking for sponsorship and um, I got maybe one or two replies and that was it just that's it that was it yeah but you know people want to back a winning horse and at that stage I had only just started to get a few results I bet you if you had won something or had a groundbreaking situation there'd be of course, that would have yeah, yeah turned yeah, things around, yeah. and you would have. But I, if I had waited any, a bit longer, you know, and my career did progress, then you'd, then maybe I would have had a little bit more more um, success in them getting back to me. Uh, when somebody goes to Wimbledon as a spectator, or when they see uh, you know tennis live, what do you see, what 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 do you learn live that you don't see on the TV? I think everyone generally when they go to live tennis are struck by the pace of the ball. It doesn't doesn't quite it's not captured on TV. Um and yeah, I think that's probably the, the, the main one. The movement as well. And I think the the amount of court coverage, the amount that goes into maybe winning a point, um that they would be there I think that they tend to be the takeaways for, for most team. people, yeah. The pace of the ball, yeah. I remember like just Djokovic there, you know, he doesn't look like he's hitting the ball that hard, but then if you see it at the ground level or court level, you see that he's really like, there's a lot of power behind his shots. Um, and then the movement, yeah, it's amazing. You just see them, uh, it's just phenomenal how much court coverage they do and that anticipation plays into that as well. But still the physical demands that that takes, it's impressive. One thing I found interesting as I kind of moved through the, through the rankings, Often at the, the lower levels, uh, futures events, I often found sometimes the guys were nearly, in some ways, hitting the ball harder. 
um, and it was more difficult to predict what was going to happen. Um, sometimes when you play the guy top 100 or top 50, his game, the, the Spanish coaches have a phrase, somebody's game is organised. Like their games are more organised and you almost can predict what, you're, what they're going to do. It might, it might be difficult to beat them, but sometimes the futures matches could be almost more difficult and more uncomfortable because it's almost a bit more random. Um, so tactically, like the players yeah, play. Yeah, yeah. Um, and also nearly they, they're almost focused a bit more on consistency. Um, so it was sort of a strange anomaly. Sometimes I felt like when I was playing the top 100 guys, they almost hit the ball a little bit slower than the guys, you know, 900, 1,000 in the world. Uh, 113 for Cavan, 111 for Westmeath in the Talton Cup final after 58 minutes. Who's going to win tomorrow then, Connor, Nyland, um, Djokovic or Kyrgios? I said, I said Djokovic at the start of the tournament, so I'm, I'm, I'm going I'm to pick him. Um, but uh, yeah, it'll be, it'll be interesting. And Jenny? I'm going to say Djokovic in four sets. Okay. And obviously, as we said at the very start of the conversation, there's a participatory element uh, for people to pick up a racket. Um, if you're not going to be a, a competitor, but if you want to maybe get fitter, picking up a racket, is it going to sort out your fitness? Well, it's a good place to start. Um, it depends, though. Like a lot of people come to tennis and think that they're going to get fitter, but you know, you need to kind of compound that with some other exercise as well. But yeah, if you're playing singles, you know, two, three times a week, it's going to improve your fitness for sure. Um, but yeah, it's a good place to start anyway. Well, I've really enjoyed having the conversation with you, Jenny Claffey and Conor Ireland. Uh, I don't know if you're going to have the Robinson's Barley Water out tomorrow, but um, you know, <laughs> have you got plans with the plans to watch the final? Is it a, a big ritual or everything to watch the Wimbledon final? Yeah, I mean, I'll I'll I'll, I'll try and uh, um, uh, I'll try and get a couple of hours away from the from the kids and and, and watch it. Um, it can it's amazing though. I remember like the Australian Open. I think this year, you know, it was nine a.m. or whatever start, and you're still sitting there at one p.m. and everyone's <laughs> like, "Come on, we need to leave the house." Yeah, um, yeah no, it's amazing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And Jenny, yes, definitely. I have a few friends get to get them together tomorrow, and uh, some of my family, so we're going to watch that. Okay, well, enjoy it, and thanks so much for coming in again, guys. And uh, thanks a million. Thanks, this is God. off the ball uh, Saturday on News Talk. We're going to take a break. We're back uh, after that. Five three one zero six for any text messages. We're going to build up to the All Ireland semi final. Derry and Galway, Paddy Andrews, and get the latest from the. Talking Cup fine.